perfect. Now I can see it's recording. Good Excellent. Morning. Thanks for that. Okay, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, our Blues from Home program and the Staying Healthy in Lockdown series. Uh, this is the third uh, part of our, our series. Thank you for tuning in. For those of you that have been watching uh, the recordings after the fact, um, thank you for that. Also, uh, just a reminder, you can always go to our website, click on any of the calendar events. You just need to scroll back to July now if you want to look at the last two weeks. Um, but you can go and view any of the sessions there, any of the strength and conditioning, ball handling, um, the classes in session with with, with our coaches um, and, and any of these sessions as well. So, um, Without further ado, I'll, I'll launch into things because um, this man is a, is a very busy man and, um, and we're very lucky to, to have him with us tonight. Um, Durham McInnes is the uh, director and, and head coach at Core Advantage, which I think most people will know about, but those that don't, um, is, a, is a high performance uh, facility in uh, Oakley, Durham. Are you in Oakley? Oakley South, yep. Oakley South. Um, Durham, you work with Melbourne Boomers, uh, with all the Basketball Victoria, uh, SDP and NPP athletes, and the Melbourne Ice hockey team. Is that correct? Yeah. Correct. Amongst a, amongst a few others. So yeah, um, yeah, we're very lucky to have you tonight. So thank you for giving up your time. We really appreciate it, Durham. Thanks for having me. All right, shall I uh, jump in? Hey guys, uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, share my screen. Just a quick remark. Sorry, just a quick reminder, anyone, if you've got any questions, I think, um, Durham, you're happy for people to just unmute yeah. themselves, jump in at yeah, different just, intervals. Just jump in and ask questions. Let's, let's make this interactive. And look, if I'm about to answer the question two slides away, I'll say, hold up, I've got this. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, you know, feel free. Yeah. Um, Perfect. Cool. Okay, I'm asking it to share screen. Okay, so at the moment you should see the presenter view, and hopefully, there we go. Now, what can you see? That's perfect. Can you see the yep. proper perfect view. Yep. yep, that's right. And Jared, do tell me. Um, last week I was doing a Zoom, and I was about fifteen slides in, and the, the host very gently said, "Hey, we can still only see the first slide." Yeah, <laughs> so, we we did the same thing last week with Harmsy in our classes in session. He hadn't actually started the presentation, and every time he was hitting yeah. space bar, it was just staying where it was. So, yeah. So I'll, do tell me if we're not if we're not I'll, moving. I'll let you know straight away. Right. Far away. We should be seeing a thing saying introduction right now. Are we good? No, that didn't no. work. No. There you go. So what are you seeing now? Still just says pressure makes diamonds. It's still just the this lead is page. Very interesting. Okay. Uh, white. That's a white page. Okay. Yeah. Uh, moving now. No. No. Nope. Right, I'm going to go back to back to square one. This is. Uh, I'm going to stop the share, and I'll have a careful look at. Um, it's funny, uh, I've done quite a few of these now and um, I'm not really sure what's changed. Um, screen share. Maybe I'll just try desktop one instead of that. Sorry guys. And what can you see now? Uh, now we're back on the, uh, the main page, the first page. Pressure makes diamonds. Now. now introduction. Yep, yep, that's where. Yes, victory. All right, we've got this. Excellent. Okay, uh, thanks for tuning in, guys, and uh, being part of this. As I said, uh, feel free to uh, pop up with any questions. Uh, I'm going to walk you through some thoughts we have uh, about how you can make the situation the, the least worst. A little bit of intro about me. As um, Jared mentioned, I'm a specialist in athletic development. Uh, working in various different capacities. Um, also serve on the advisory board at Deakin University, the undergrad sports science degree. Um, and I'm the head coach at Core Advantage, where we have about 250 athletes across 20 plus sports. So we're most known in basketball. We actually train a lot of other sports as well. Uh, and I, I really, I made this presentation because I was concerned about the mental health and physical health of our athletes going to the, into the second lockdown. And as things are ramping up a little further, that concern definitely isn't going away. Um, but I also have this kind of lifelong fascination with 
uh, how we can feel a lot better from our training. So training is a means to an end for athletes in terms of making them stronger, faster and better. But I think it's also a means to an end in terms of keeping healthy and happy. So I'm just going to walk you through some of some of my thoughts on that. Um, I suppose the first thing is that, to be crystal clear that COVID-19 sucks. There's no, no two ways about that. Uh, I think a lot of us and our athletes feel kind of buffeted around like we're in stormy seas. Uh, we don't have a lot of control over a situation. We just have to wait and see what happens. And it's, it's, it's not been that great. Um, but the, the reframe on it is what if we could kind of surf the wave? What if we could take control and, and extract some advantage out of the situation? Um, so that can range from, you know, as a business, like we're currently doing a whole lot of online courses that we're, that we're, we're building because we've got the time uh, to working on your non-dominant hand with your shooting. Like there's a, there's a million different little things that you can do to take advantage of it. Um, and I suppose that the thing to, I think of with the athletes is we have this, this response ability. So the ability to respond to the situation. So, we don't have to just be reactive. We can actually choose how we react, um, how we respond. Uh, and just the power of doing that, just the power of deciding that you're going to make some decisions and make some plans, that in itself actually helps you cope with a difficult situation because you have a sense of agency. So that has its own effect on your brain because you're now, the situation's still happening, but you're now the driver rather than the passenger in the situation. Um, one of the things is we can make different style plans. So this, this is my schedule at the moment and my schedule has never looked this empty in my entire adult life, uh, which is nice because I can do stuff that's on, on, on my terms a little bit more. So there are, there are opportunities uh, built in here. And the other thing is that when you do make a plan or with an, when an athlete of yours does make a plan, that feeling of control and agency uh, they, give, they get a little dopamine hit, so all of a sudden they start to feel better instantly just from doing that. Um, so there's, there's a lot to be said uh, for that. Um, just that ability to make your own little plans. Uh, the other thing is uh, we can set up systems to try and stay happy. So there are a lot of little things that have a cumulative, like a significant effect uh, if you get them right. So uh, I'm going to talk about a few of those. Um, First one is the great sleep loop. So if you're training well, you're gonna support great sleep. And if you're sleeping well, you're getting this wonderful, wonderful, and it's the opposite of a vicious cycle. So you sleep great, you have great energy, uh, you train well, you eat well, because uh, we do eat worse when we haven't slept well. Um, and at the end of the day, you are relaxed, happy, your body's tired, your brain's happy, you've had a good day, and then you sleep great and you're just in this ongoing loop. So um, great training supports great sleep, um, but having that training taken away can disrupt that significantly. So uh, it's finding ways to maintain that training and therefore maintain the sleep. Because when we stop getting sleep, we do unravel. We can unravel pretty quickly uh, and it can have a lot of, of flow on effects. So that's, that's I think, the, the lead domino benefit of some good training. Uh, the cool thing too is that if you happen to not get a good night's sleep, which will happen from time to time, uh, great training will enhance your energy. So you're actually going to feel better, uh, particularly if you've done a bit of training in the morning, everyone feels a little bit better. You actually increase the energy. We tend to, I think there's a misconception of thinking of us as being like an, like an iPhone or something as though we're, where our, our battery energy is finite and once it's down, it's down. It's like, no, a bit of activity actually invigorates our system. So we, we feel better. Uh, and this is a really huge one in this current setting is um, great training down regulates our anxiety mechanisms. So a big part of our anxiety mechanisms and our fear uh, response is the amygdala. And it's the small little bit of the brain that tells us about it. It's, a, it's the rapid threat assessment part of our brain. Um, and when you do a, a good like a half hour cardio session, for instance, uh, is going to significantly reduce amygdala activation. Basically, physiologically and psychologically, it's harder for you to get stressed when you've done training. So I go for a run um, tomorrow, and at the end of that run, I'm going to have, uh, even if I want to stress about 
things, I'm going to have trouble doing it. It's just disabling the stress mechanism, which is, which is pretty cool. Uh, and on the flip side, what it's also doing is, whilst it's disabling the stress mechanism, you're less able to worry, it's enhancing uh, your um, executive function of your prefrontal cortex in particular. So it's improving your cognition, making you able to think better about your problems. So you're less able to stress, you've slept well, and you can now think through stuff with greater clarity and, and sort of mental power. Um, so it's a pretty cool combo. Um, and also, as much as I, I hate this lame image, it's really hard to find a good meditation image that isn't sort of people in the lotus position looking, looking really annoying. Um, great training is mindfulness in disguise. So if you're putting in a good max effort with your training, uh, it's, a, it's a chance to escape a little bit and just focus on, on the moment. So when you're really pushing it, you can't think about your to-do list. You can't think about your marks at school, whatever it may be. Um, you're just in the moment dealing with the, dealing with the pain. Um, and that's really constructive because that, that meditation, that meditative element of sport is something that we don't notice how much we get until it's taken away. Because when you're, when you're in the heat of a game, you're not, you're not worrying about anything other than the game. So you're very in the moment. Um, so there's, there's a lot of benefits there. Um, so those are, those are, one, and there's more than that. Those are my top five. Um, any questions on that so far? That'll, I mean, it seems pretty self-evident. It's just when you put it all together, it uh, makes it a pretty compelling argument. Cool. All right. Well, I'll, uh, I'll push on. Um, so the benefits are clear. Uh, the trick is setting up systems, structures, kind of rigging the game to win so that you can do it better and, and easier making it trying to turn it into downhill skiing basically make it as easy as possible for uh, people to get the great results so the first element of that rigging the game to win i think it, particularly in a covid 19 scenario is getting control of your suprachiasmatic nucleus now that's this tiny little um uh, little part of our brains a master body clock so we get light uh, into our eyeballs uh, from uh, the sun and the sun, and that light tells the suprachiasmatic nucleus uh, what the time is, tells it when to be awake, and it then sends messages to all sorts of other um, parts of the body that tell them to wake up, when to go to sleep, when to secrete melatonin, which is the waking up um, uh, neurotransmitter, when to secrete cortisol, uh, melatonin's the sleepy one rather, and cortisol's the waking up one. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. And what, what we noticed as a business was a lot of our athletes, once we went into lockdown, were spending a hell of a lot of time indoors uh, and they weren't getting all that incidental walking to the bus, waiting at the train station, out and about, walking between classrooms at school if they're in the campus where there's classes at, um, and just being outside at recess and lunchtime. Um, and we noticed that a lot of athletes really starting to struggle with their sleep patterns. Not much else had changed, but they just weren't getting good sleep. Um, so what I would say to everyone is get as much light into your eyeballs early in the day um, to really send that signal strong that it's daytime. Uh, and then at, at, in the evening, you want to get less light in uh, so that you can be telling your body it's, it's time to be sleepy. So at the extreme example, people, and there's a great book by Dr. Sachin Panda called The Circadian Code, and he's arguably the world's foremost expert on this stuff. And at the extreme end, people will um, only have like really dim little candles in their house and keep it really dull. So basically once the sun goes down, it gets pretty dull inside your house. Um, but the less extreme version of that is just avoid uh, phones and bright screens in the hour before bed, and that can make a big difference. So. Get control of your body clock or it'll get control of you is number one. Uh, and the next thing is exploiting the magic of outdoor cardio. And in an ideal world, uh, finding somewhere pretty pretty natural. This is, I live in the inner west in Melbourne uh, and this is a reclaimed quarry turned into a, a bushland just near my house. I run there every week. It's a little bit out of my way to drive there, but it's just such a beautiful run. And there is something magical that I think us as a species, we're meant to be in nature a bit more than we are. Um, and it, uh, it's really, really nice. It's a, it's a great way to do it. So at least once a week, I think some nice outdoor cardio is great. 
Um, and then you want to lift. Yes, we lift for performance, uh, but also you want to lift for a bit of health and happiness. So um, you know, I've got Jock Landale here, the big fella. Um, he probably doesn't really need to do bicep curls for his basketball performance, but he likes them. So I'll let, I'll let him do it there at the end of a workout. Um, and I think it's making sure that your athletes are doing stuff that they enjoy that is also constructive for them as well. So, and lifting, there's a lot of, there's an empowerment element with a bit of resistance training. So cardio will make you fit and you feel nice, but there's something literally empowering about doing strength training and, and feeling strong uh, and good. And the combo, you know, the better your lifting is, the better your run, the better your running is, it tends to be your lifting is a little better because you're a little fitter as well. They kind of, they kind of feed into each other. Um, and the next one is, is eat like a champion. One of the most interesting things about our stress responses is that when we're stressed, we tend to gravitate towards comfort foods, uh, which can often be pretty high carb, high sugar choices. And what that actually does, only the last few years I've really been uncovering the link between our the, the brain gut link. So the extent to which if our guts are in a bad place, if our guts are, are grumpy, uh, we're going to be depressed and vice versa. Uh, and one of the linkages is there's a neurotransmitter called serotonin, which uh, is a, a well-being where we feel good when we get a good dose of serotonin. Um, if you're eating too many uh, carby foods, too many sugary foods, you get an inflammatory response in your body and you actually can't produce serotonin effectively because your body's so busy dealing with the inflammation from all the bad foods. So that makes you more likely to be depressed, sad, and, and you know, having a bit of a difficult time. So it's almost like when we're sad, we should reach for the healthy food um, rather than the other way around. It, easier said than done. Um, but I, what I say to everyone is try and eat what I call um, paleo... I'm going to turn the heater off. I'm cooking in here. It's a small office. Uh, try and eat paleo-ish. So it doesn't mean like full perfection. And no, very rare that you succeed with really strict eating. But if you can just try and bias your food towards things that didn't come from a factory um, and towards a good variety of colours and uh, a bit of good fats and a bit of protein and a bit of carbs, uh, you, you're pretty good. And it's going to have a significant knock-on effect on your system. Your system won't be inflamed. Uh, and therefore you're, you're going to feel better mentally uh, and physically. Uh, and then the, another way of rigging the game is moving every morning. I think there's just nothing like getting up and going and just doing a bit of something in the morning. For some people, I, I do all my, I hate training at night. I always do my training in the morning. For others, they might not have the time to do a full train, but even just for the 10, 20 minute walk, just getting out early in the day, uh, has such a knock-on benefit in terms of how you feel about the whole day, um, gets your thoughts in order. Um, so a bit of, if you can, uh, and a lot of people now, for you know, a lot of people will, will always give them the reason slash excuse, oh, I can't, I've got to go to work. And usually, well, you could get up earlier. Um, but at the moment, people have got a little more control of their own schedule. So uh, there's a lot to be said for trying to get a, a morning uh, exercise practice in. Um, and the other way of hacking uh, your way to rigging the game is uh, treating sleep like a master skill. So if we get the sleep right, everything else goes as it was in that bad, in that loop in the in the last section. Um, but rather than just wishing for good sleep, uh, we should try and set the game up to win. Uh, so let's learn what works for you. So some people sleep better when it's hotter. A lot sleep better when it's a little bit colder. Um, I know, for instance, for me, uh, I, I track my sleep by an app on my on my on my Apple Watch. Um, I know that my sleep is abysmal. If I lift, if I do a weight training session at say four in the Arvo, uh, I will have a horrible night's sleep. Um, whereas I know if I do a weight training session at seven in the morning, I'll generally have a cracking night's sleep. So you know, I lift in the morning. Um, I know that if I'm if I'm doing work after dinner. Uh, there's a real linkage there, so it's so I never. So my rule is, um, which I'm, I break maybe, maybe four times a year. My rule is don't do work after dinner, like eat your dinner and then just chill out afterwards. So treat it like a bit of a skill. Um, I think that can really pay off. And again, it's it's a funny thing presenting this stuff because 
each thing in isolation is pretty obvious. It's just trying to put it all together into kind of a coherent program to make it really, really work. Um, one of the best ways you can help make it work too is finding ways to make training the path of least resistance, finding the ways to make the choice. And this doesn't have to be training, this could be anything, but it's finding ways to make doing the thing you wanted to do the easier thing than every other option. Uh, so the classic case was a former um, client of mine who struggled with, uh, with depression and um, struggled to get in shape and just w understood intellectually what he needed to do, but was not able to get it done in terms of consistently putting together a, a training block. Uh, and in the end, I, I, I wouldn't say I cracked it, but I kind of said, look, we've, we've got to do something decisive here. And I made him park his car in, I knew he lived on a, on a road that had a clearway. And I said, you're gonna park your car in the clearway so that you have to get your car, you have to get up and move the car or it will be towed every morning. Um, but when you get up, you're gonna move it by driving it to the gym and you're gonna do a workout and come home. Uh, and that worked amazingly for him because he got up, he went down to the car and like you're in the car, it's like, oh, I'm halfway there, I may as well all go. And he built that, that momentum. Now, not many of us live on a clear way, so we can't all do that. Um, for instance, one of the tricks I recommend everyone does is the, the best little trick in the world. It costs you no time at all, um, is you lay out your training gear the night before. So if I'm going for a run, I lay out every piece of running equipment I'm going to need. I lay it out in the clothes so they're in the right order. So I, I grab the first thing, put it on. Um, the beauty of that is A, it's uh, easy because you've just laid it all out and you just kind of follow what, you know, you follow what past Durham said you should do in my, in my case. Um, but the real beauty is if I want to wuss out of that workout, if I want to find an excuse because it's raining or it's cold or I'm tired and I don't feel like it, I have to gather up all those clothes and I have to do this walk of shame back to my bedroom and I have to put every one of those clean training clothes back in the cupboard uh, and then start my day. Um, I've literally never done that because once you lay those clothes out, it's like, it's a foregone conclusion. So that's a great trick that, that anyone can do. Um, and it's and when, I, when you share this, it's amazing how many people have uh, say, oh yeah, I do, I do that. Like it's a, actually a, a common secret little trick that consistent trainers use. Um, so yeah. Parts of least resistance. Um, the other thing is um, writing your dopamine. So it, when we get a whole bunch of people like a post that we've done on Instagram or a story or something on Facebook or whatever, we get a bit of a dopamine hit. We feel good. When we complete tasks, we get a dopamine hit. Um, and so uh, social media companies are exploiting us via that, that mechanism because they want to sell our eyeballs to advertisers. Uh, but we can exploit ourselves in the sense of, I use an app, this is, this is called Streaks, uh, and it tracks, I tick, tick the box when I've trained each day, and it just tracks it. Um, so I get a little dopamine hit, and I get a sense of where I'm at. The nice thing about Streaks is you'll see there's days I've missed. So one of the worst things is if you're purely doing streak-based training, where it's like, I want to get as many in a row, you know, you get to, um, you get to 17, like that's, that's my best streak, and you break it and you go, oh, well, what's the point? It's all, it's all gone. But the thing I like about this is it gives you a percentage stat as well. So yes, I want to keep my streak, but I really want to keep my percentage uh, above 90%. And as you can see, I'm, I'm falling a little short on the uh, 89.7. But that's quite kind of a good idea as well, I reckon. Um, costs like $4, um, but pretty good little app. So, uh, any questions on rigging the game? Um, so there's a fair bit in that, but yeah. No, nope, we're all good. Cool. Okay. Uh, I'm going to dive a little bit into the, to the nuts and bolts uh, of, of the, the how um, and the what, I suppose. Um, let's get into that. So in an ideal world, athletes and non-athletes, um, yeah, we should all be getting a minimum of three short strength and power sessions per week. Uh, keeps the body going, uh, keeps uh, as an anti-aging mechanism, keeps everything strong and in, in good shape. 
that's particularly important from a sporting point of view because we are going to come back out of this lockdown and we're going to see an epidemic of injuries. Um, the, the, the high not load we normally get and then the deload and then the reload, um, it's, going to, it's going to be, it's, it's like the ultimate mechanism for making injuries. It's really interesting. I was watching the Premier's um, conference, news conference today announcing all the changes and someone asked, uh, why aren't we shutting down horse racing? And he said, we can't shut down horse racing because the, uh, the animal cruelty issue, like, there'll be too many injuries to all the horses if we made them stop racing for a while and then start racing again later. And so, so that's ex exactly what we're gonna experience with humans, um, but because it's horses and, and we invest a lot of money in them, uh, we can't stop them training. So I thought that was really interesting. So uh, three 30 minute strength and power sessions per week. Um, and then ideally three uh, conditioning sessions a week as well uh, as a minimum. So um, a few runs, a bike ride, whatever it might be. Um, but particularly from an athletic point of view, getting some high intensity work where it's hard enough that you get out of your head a little bit because it's, it's, it's so intense. Um, that's, uh, and you know, you want them spaced. Obviously you don't do three weights and then you three um, conditioning, you want them spaced out. Uh, the way we've done it for our athletes is for every core advantage athlete. So we're programming for all of our people um, online. And so because there's, we can put them all on one schedule, every core advantage athlete is doing weight, weight training Monday, Wednesday, Saturday, and then they're doing cardio Tuesday, Thursday, um, Sunday or Tuesday, um, Thursday, Friday for some of them, most of them Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday. Um, and that's just a good way to go. So we've got it well spaced. Uh, and then I think, uh, a really underrated thing is a nice walk in the park, um, a nice easy cardio or, or a slow jog, nice bike ride. It doesn't have to be making you mega fit for it to be good value for you. Um, and also just getting that vitamin D. Um, we talked earlier about the supercrise magnetic nucleus issue with, with the, the, the body clock, but I do think we're going to see uh, an epidemic of bony stress, like stress fracture issues, because we're going to have this this perfect storm of athletes being deloaded and their bones getting really weak. And as they're deloaded, they're also simultaneously getting less and less vitamin D because they're, they're stuck inside. Uh, and then we're going to reload them. And we're going to try to be really progressive, but it's still going to be tough. Uh, and I, I think there's a genuine chance of having the highest ever rate of stresses. Uh, so just getting that sunlight onto your skin is going to be really, not, not getting sunburned, obviously. Um, but getting enough of that to keep the system healthy. Sunlight's very important to our system. Uh, and the thing that I'm trying to impress upon all the athletes is, is this idea that uh, our training might normally be at a high level and we have a holiday injury or in this case, a lockdown, and we move to a very low level of training. And the classic mistake, and we see this every summer with the Australia Day tournament, is train hard all year, there's, there's five weeks off uh, where you don't do that much, try and resume and you get an injury either straight away or an injury somewhere within the next month. Um, so the work that we're putting in now, the point of it is not to maintain a normal training because that's impossible, but it's to make the training load look like this. So you are still getting some, and look, it might be lower than that. It might not be that high. It might only be 40% um, of, of normal full volume. It doesn't, matter that much. What matters is just doing your best to keep that training load up. Because uh, I, I think there's nothing, there's gonna be nothing worse. It's bad enough to miss a whole bunch of sport because of lockdown, um, but there's no blaming yourself. There's no what if, there's no if only. But if you miss a whole bunch of sport and um, then you come back and then you get injured straight away and you miss a whole bunch because you didn't put the work in, that's the annoying. Uh, so yeah. And the way that I like to think about these things is we have, we have to think of the base of structural integrity that our body has, the adaptations. These adaptations build up over time. So our tendons, ligaments, bones, muscles, they build, we, we apply the stress of sport and they rebuild themselves stronger and better in response to it. Um, we have work capacity and that's just basically our fitness. Um, uh, our ability to do work. On top of that's our movement skill. Can we sprint, run, jump, cut? Are we good at that stuff? Uh, and then 
the icing on the cake in many ways and, and the big separator at the pointy end of sport is our explosiveness. But we can't be explosive if we've got an Achilles tendon rupture. Um, so we saw um, Chelsea D'Angelo, uh, what is she, a 20-year-old ruptured her Achilles uh, the other week. She's part of our Boomers, uh, Boomers squad. Um, I've never seen a 20-year-old rupture an Achilles before in all of my life. Um, and we're going to see, I'm concerned we're going to see a little bit more of that because she lost those adaptations during during lockdown and then resumed um, much too, at much too high level too soon. Um, uh, or I mean, it could have been that one in a million, but it seems a pretty big coincidence to me. And I think we're just going to see a, a bit of that. Um, so structural integrity, really, really important. And the way we support that stuff is uh, train hard and recover well. And so recovery comes down to getting good sleep. Uh, there's just no substitute for time. If you've done a hard session on a Monday and your body's not adapted and prepared for that session, often you're actually not fully recovered from that session until um, till Thursday. It can be a 72-hour turnaround, particularly in the early days. Uh, so uh, allowing time for the body to recover, allowing at least a 48-hour, so Monday, Tuesday recovery day and then uh, Wednesday um, is going at it. That's so much better. Like training Monday, Wednesday is infinitely better than training Monday, Tuesday in terms of that uh, ground reaction force, that, that, uh, that impact. Um, and then nutrition, super important. Talked about that already. And then active recovery. Uh, a lot of people will think that active recovery can fix everything as though it's the big rock. It's nice and it's an important thing, but it's the least of the four key pillars of recovery in terms of the actual effect it can have. It's, it's not a one percenter, but it's closer to it, whereas sleep and time and nutrition, they're huge. So um, that's that stuff. Uh, I'll just walk you guys quickly through what we sort of offer to our people. And what's, and what's interesting is we're getting quite a lot of inquiries, people who want us to write programs for them. Uh, and their teams are online. Um, so we're doing a fair bit of that these days. So we got pretty good at it in the first lockdown. So it's a new skill set we've got. We use an online platform called Team Builder. Uh, we have painstakingly uploaded a video of every activity within that so that when we program for the athletes, they get little videos telling them how to do everything. It logs every rep that's done so we get a completion rate. Um, and we combine that with Zoom catch ups with coaches. Um, and we also have sports psych um, and we have nutritional support from Dr. Dominic Kondo, works with uh, us, the Melbourne Boomers and Geelong Football Club. Um, and at the moment, just launched today, we have the Court Advantage Cup, which is a competitive thing where our athletes are competing for prizes and stuff to, uh, to keep it interesting. Um, and all the resources that we normally put out. So our, our podcast, The Random Thoughts Show, uh, and our Instagram, we're putting content out there as well. Uh, and actually, I'm doing a little bit, well, a bit lazy at the moment because I've been flat chat with a couple of other things. Um, but I'm doing a bit on my own account as well, uh, which might be interesting around this this sort of stuff around training and sort of nerding out on a bit of that stuff. So um, yeah, that's that's the presentation. Um, yeah, thanks for for paying attention. Hopefully, hopefully it was interesting. Um, and feel free to hit me up with any questions. Thank you, Durham. I've, I've got a quick question, um, which came through from one of our coaches and, and someone who works in the office with us, actually, Daniel. Um, he wanted to know, what are your thoughts on um, physio, strength and conditioning, personal training, I guess a lot of the allied health fields that are based on getting performance or getting adaptation, you know, through training, um, mm. what are your thoughts on those being uh, grouped together in a player or a parent's mind in terms of how we um, deliver those things to a, to, I guess, in a basketball sense to a community association and how we communicate that? Yeah, it's, it's such an interesting area, isn't it? Because um, we have an, a, a convergence where strength and conditioning coaches are very interested in how bodies break. So we want to talk to the physios. Physios are interested in performance as well. So they, they want to, uh, and because they know the body so intimately, they uh, will often uh, really want to get into the training side of that stuff as well. So we have interesting, uh, where, when it works well, you can have this wonderful harmonious relationship where you get really good results. But sometimes you can get 
people that in a physio setting in the same way that I'm not particularly, I would never diagnose someone. Physios will recommend someone do exercise. It's like, yeah, it's not really quite your area. So they are different things. I would say though, that what you want to do is you want to have um, where possible an approach that embraces elements of the, the, the concept that physios have given us all is that idea of don't just make someone stronger, make them better first, make things work well. So in terms of messaging to athletes, like a little bit of physio for proactively preventing treatments, a wonderful thing. Um, but if I'm doing my job, or if the strength and conditioning coach is doing the job well, you, le- you need less and less physio. Uh, hmm. It's sort of uh, my thought. Does that sort of answer that? I think so, yeah. I, I think also maybe what he meant was um, probably without being... Uh, not to put uh, put down any... Speak your mind. Yeah, yeah. Not to put down any one profession, but, but we do see um, a lot of... I guess, personal trainers and personal trainers are great. Uh, I don't mean this to, to knock them, but they do, a lot of them do present themselves as strength and conditioning coaches. Oh, that upsets me so much. Yeah. Yeah. That's like, <laughs> that's like hairdressers pretending they're rocket scientists, pretending they're brain, brain surgeons. Um, yeah. It drives me mental. Um, people have done a six week course and they saw a thing on, on Instagram and like, yeah, let's do this. It's going to be great for you. And it ruins people. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, like a, clearly I'm biased because I've spent my life dedicated to human performance, but it drives me mental. And the, the problem is that the stuff that's great for you doesn't look that good. Like if you, yeah. if you watch Maddie Garrick come in working out with me, none of it's going to look particularly amazing for Instagram because it's just the fundamentals done brutally well. It's, you know, it's like, it's just like executing a perfect chess pass. Like if you want to get a whole bunch of views on your Instagram, you know, have you have your players doing a perfect chess pass? Well, that's not going to get nothing. Whereas mm. having some stupid trick shot drill um, might. Yeah. Um, it's a bit like that. Yeah. So don't yeah. get me started. Um, so I think. How would you navigate that for parents? Is it is it just to do your research on who you're taking your advice from, or who you're basically yeah um, who, who uh, you're doing your business to? Do you, do your research, and what you want to look for is people that have an established track record of working with athletes, particularly if it's young athletes, because they're a different different beast. Um, and just that sense of if if someone promises you they're going to suddenly make you amazing really quickly, um, it's rubbish. And if someone is smashing you, training you really hard, if it's all about how how sweaty and queasy you get, that's also just not right. So this. One of the, probably the most upsetting trends for me has been the whole um, F45's gone crazy uh, and a lot of athletes doing that. And like that's, if people want to get sweaty and just, just, you know, like there's a great saying, anyone can make you tired. Like my son's 10 and if he was working out a, a couple of athletes, he could make them tired by telling him to do all these things. That doesn't mean he's a good trainer. It just means he's good at making them get tired. So look for people that actually have a track record and a bit of a strategy, I suppose, would be, uh, be what I would yep. say. Yeah. No, it's good advice. Yeah. And it is hard. It's hard to navigate because it is frustrating. And, and you know, I, I come from a strength and conditioning background as well. Yeah. And you, you don't want to sound elitist, but at the same time, you're trying to tell parents like, that's great. You've got a personal trainer, but, and it's not, a, it's not a personal trainer thing. You've just got to make that that make sure that personal trainer has done their research or has a track record or has done a, a um, an Australian accreditation course or something in human like yeah. athletic performance and athletic development. I think that's really important. Yeah, I think I think it's 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 an important distinction to be able to draw. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Does anyone, um, I know Durham, uh, you've got to get going. Um, oh, this is a good one from, from yeah, Mel. Sure. Um, I think you probably get this one quite a bit. Um, what age would you recommend athletes start lifting? And again, I think by that Mel probably means actual um, weight in terms of resistance, not necessarily resistance bands or body weight, yeah. things like that. So just Look, particularly weight. It, it really depends depends on the athlete so it'll it's you know it's the classic answer in, in strength conditioning is it depends um if you bring in a um a 13 year old with really bad osgood slatters which is a growing disease of the, of the knees where you get a real inflammation um in the enthesis in, in your knee um i'll have that that athlete do some leg extensions which is technically weights 
because that'll um, make the that'll create some analgesia, some pain relief at the site, and it'll actually change the tendon and make it stronger. Um, so it's not it's it's sort of like there's there's not really like I I wouldn't have a ten year old and bother with weights. Eleven probably not. Around twelve to thirteen is a good time to start doing really light, age appropriate, shape based training. So you're not not trying to lift the house at all you're just learning how to how to make shapes uh, and so one of the most important shapes that you can make is a squat and not like a really deep squat i think that's that's unnecessary for most athletes but we're talking about you know just it's like that sort of a squat so just a, a moderate squat and the interesting thing is um if they can do that they can now land better box out better jump better everything's going to go better but you actually, it's easier to teach someone to squat a little bit. If I take a, um, a five kilo, little little dumbbell, five kilo dumbbell and put it here, they can now squat better than with no weight. Mm -hmm. So our view is weights used moderately in an age appropriate progressive way um, are really, really useful. Um, some people are scared of weight training at all for juniors because they've heard the myth that weight training stunts your growth. So I think that's probably the most important thing to address. That's, that's kind of the elephant in the room. Um, and the problem with that is that it's not, it's not true. The full sentence uh, that is true is Olympic lifting weight training, where you, you know, clean and jerk and the snaps and that kind of thing. Heavy Olympic lifting weight training in the 1980s, a number of athletes got damaged growth plates. So that definitely, definitely damaged them. Um, but age appropriate non ballistic lifting, so doing some light squats and so forth, actually makes the muscles stronger, which means they absorb the kinetic energy better than the growth plates. So now they're actually protecting their growth rather than risking it. So um, a, a, a good dose of intelligent, scientific, age appropriate resistance training is probably the best thing you can ever do because every element of that athlete's game is going to be better. Uh, they're going to be stronger, more resilient, better durability. They're going to move better, um, but it's just the the right dose, um, not not overdosing on it. Yeah, that's no, terrific. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, I haven't got any other questions come through, so um, I'll uh, yeah, there are a couple of good ones for us, and probably ones that you you get pretty regularly. Um, well, maybe not the, the PT one, but that was a good one from Daniel. Um, I missed that one. You helped me, helped me find, find my way to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've, I've, unfortunately, I know him. So, yeah, I knew what he was getting at. <laughs> he hears me talk about it a fair bit. I've got one quick one for you. Um, and just yeah, sure. completely off base, more just personal interest because I'm a big fan of yours. What are you reading right now? Just to put you on the spot. What are you reading in terms of books or, or anything like that? Um, I've just finished a book by Douglas Copeland, um, which is just a fictional, he's like a, a 1990s fictional author, um, which uh, I didn't mind. Uh, in fact, it's, it's coincidence, the um, client of mine I was talking about with the um, Clearway that I was talking yep. about before, yep. uh, he was moving house and so, so he, had in he had 20 books by this one author and said, does anyone want them? And I was like, oh, I'll go. I was all right. Um, but I'm reading that. I'm dipping back into The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday, which is a really interesting book. Seems very timely uh, about using obstacles to, um, as you know, th you know, things you can make advantage of. Um, and I'm trying to read um, uh, the um, Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. Oh, yeah. uh, which is uh, a classic that everyone talks about, uh, but I just don't have the emotional energy for it at the moment. I'm like, ah, oh, I feel like it's kind of something less, uh, less serious. Yep. Um, yeah. It's, it's a bit of a, um, it's a bit of hard work that one. Yeah. It's a tough. Yeah. It's a bit of a grind and it feels like a bit, bit too much at the moment. So it's, uh, at the moment I, I love reading because it's interesting, but at the moment I'm just I'm reading to get to sleep to be honest. <laughs> so, yeah. That's right. That's yeah. Pretty unimpressive answer. No, no, that's all right. All good. I thought. What, what are you reading at the moment? What's that, sorry? What are you reading at the moment? Uh, the David Goggins. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. The, the, the Marine. Guy, yeah. yeah, I think it's called, is it called Get Hard? Yeah, all about his life and what he went through in order to get to the, the Navy SEALs. And that's uh, an eye-opener, that that's one. Cool. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. yeah. 
So, hey, um, we've got another question um, about um, how many times for breath and ice, how many times you lift? Um, three times a three times a week uh, oh. is a good amount of times to lift. I think. I think um, twice a week is more than twice as good as once. Three times a week um, leaves you in a pretty good spot. Where if you miss one, you end up just getting getting two. Four times it starts to become the law of diminishing returns. Uh, I think uh, the perfect lifting in many ways is um, an AB split twice a week. So you do one kind of pushy workout on Monday, you do a pulley kind of workout on Wednesday, and you do a pushy kind of workout um, on Friday. Uh, so you never get a chance to get bored of it. You don't have a chance to create training based injuries because there's a decent recovery between. If you're doing something wrong, if you're doing something wrong on Monday, there's a decent chance that whatever you made grumpy on the Monday will be fine by the Friday. Um, but also it's short enough time that you can actually take advantage of that adaptation. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of, an, of a relatively simple AB split. Yep. Uh, and then if you miss one, if you miss that, if you miss one of those ones, you've still got it in once that week. So you're at least not going to go backwards. So you do push twice. Usually. I know. So you, so you go A, B, A, B. So you go push, oh, okay. yep. go Monday push, Wednesday pull, Monday pu push, and then the next. So it's um, push, pull. So it just alternates all yep. the way through. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, yeah. It, it works really well. I really like it. Yeah. Oh, terrific. All right. Well, we might wrap things up there then, Durham. Thank you very much um, for, for jumping on tonight. We really appreciate it. As, as you mentioned, there's, there's a heap of resources. Um, we're, we're, we're extremely lucky to, to have you, uh, I guess, engaged in the sport or in sport in general and, and making so much of the work that you and your team do um, available on your website. And it's, uh, the majority of it's free and, and it's terrific. And, and, and the paid stuff is, is well and truly worth it as well. And um, yeah, I, I really uh, appreciate you giving up your time. Uh, I, I'm constantly pushing your stuff out to our coaches, but, but if anyone that's cool. listening in tonight or listening after the fact, just, just jump on the, the core advantage website and it's um, most of it's a free to lo sign up and, and you can access all, of um, Durham's and his team's resources, um, webinars and things like that are, are all on there and there's recorded. A good one too. You can you can use um, our hot. There's if you do a core advantage holiday programs. We made it last summer, uh, and it's kind of the idea. It's just full of workouts you can do at home and video stuff, and there's there's plenty of stuff there as well. So uh, yeah. No, I really appreciate it, Darren. We, um, yeah, as I said, I, I push a lot of this stuff on our on our teams and on our coaches, and they don't always want to hear it. So it's good to hear it from another voice, um, such good. as yourself. So thanks very much for jumping on tonight, and um, we'll let you get back to your evening and uh, hopefully get home before curfew, or else I'll get locked up by the military. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in a hustle. Okay, all right. Thanks, um, thanks everyone for all joining. Right, thanks. I really appreciate all it. Right. These guys. See you later. See ya. Bye.